Hello and welcome to this very interesting session and it's going to be a conversation between me and uh, Miss Arya VM. She is a second year MA student at Pondicherry University and uh, she's currently interning on this uh, course short fiction in Indian literature. Hello. Hello ma'am. Hi. So um, what are your thoughts on this particular story? Uh, actually it's very interesting story like now we are living in a world we are fully equipped with uh, all the kind of technology but it's actually about how people were in awe by seeing just a calculator. Absolutely. So it's like a very interesting one and it's also it's not just about technology and the advent of machines it's also about human emotions and how viable we are. True. So how, how adaptable we are yeah. to some of the inventions that come into our lives, right? And how we kind of master them in some sense too. Okay, so um, we also need to remember that this calculator was a new thing. It's a, it's a newfangled invention back then. So this is not a story that's set in the contemporary times, but probably in the mid 20th century when India saw the calculator for the first time. And that reaction is brought into the picture. So the uh, timeline for the story is somewhere back in the uh, 20th century. Okay. I have a set of questions on it, so shall okay. I? Yeah, please. So first of all, uh, the title was quite intriguing for me. L reflowering, it literally refers to flower again mm -hmm. or a renewal. So in the story, metaphorically, it may stand for the renewal of warmth between Rautar and Ambi's father or a rejuvenation of human potential. So ma'am, according to you, how far does the title contribute to the understanding of the story? Yeah, you're quite right. Um, the title does have a lot of significance for the set of meanings that the author wants to communicate through this particular story and you are right to point out that there is a rejuvenation of the bond between Ravutar and uh, uh, Ambi's father who is the shop owner and there is also a, a blossoming of the spirit of Ravutar himself so all these metaphorical uh, references to getting the spirit back getting the youth back in some sense is uh, reflected in this particular title reflowering and it basically centers around the figure of the old man and that in itself is very interesting because he's very old and to reflower again to blossom again at that particular stage in life is very very uh, interesting and heartwarming to see as well and how this old figure tries to dominate everybody around him and it, it's really nice and cheerful to see that message communicated right at the beginning symbolically through the title and see that happening at the end of the story as well so it's a, it's a nice um, slate of hand in some sense on the part of the author Sura yeah actually like he seems to be very energetic yes, at the end yes absolutely and we can also think about the author himself who wrote until the uh, you know until when he was really very old as well he continued to write in his 90s I think so um, so we, we can make certain connections between this old man Ravatar and the author himself who was a grand old man of letters. Okay. Uh, do you think that the writer intentionally made use of a narrator who's other than Ravatar or Ambi's father they may actually know the things uh, so in order to gift a sense of objectivity to the narration and how do you interpret the reference invalid? Uh, to describe the narrator and his mother. Okay, um, so we have like, uh, this is like a two-part question. There are two questions in this uh, uh, set of questions that you have. So let me address the first one, which is about uh, narration and objectivity. So uh, we need to remember that this story is told from the perspective of a young boy, the son of the mm, shopkeeper and um, it does give a certain sense of objectivity when the story is told from a young child's perspective because we always have this belief that children are fairer in some sense right they have the uh, they, they kind of tell you everything in an even-handed manner so that um, idea is uh, kind of exploited through this narration and uh, it does lend a certain sense of objectivity as well uh, because if, if the father had narrated the story and um, we can clearly um, you know get a sense of his view on things so um, instead of that that the child kind of gives a, a, a omniscient and an even-handed and almost like a third person narration is there 
but um, at occasions, at one or two moments, we can see that the uh, child is getting the mm, uh, kind of communicating the ideas of his father. There's a moment um, in the story when um, he um, narrates the events when Rauta picks all the clothes for his family and he piles the clothes um, by his side. And um, there's this line which says, how dare he do this without getting due permission? And that particular line is very interesting because we do not know whether he is interpreting that thought of the father or he is the one who is making that remark. So there is a complication there in terms of narration. It's as if there is a slight uh, free indirect discourse um, coming in, a third person uh, discourse coming in. So it, it becomes ambiguous in one or two areas. But generally speaking, we can see that the boy is even handed is fair because he uh, tells the reader that his father is anger personified. When we when we read those lines, we can see that the boy is being very fair there. And, and the father does have a, a bad temper. So we do get a certain sense of objectivity um, when we get the opinion of the mm, child. Okay, and about the... the oh, yeah, the second question. Uh, thank you for the reminder. The second question, it talks about the two invalids, right? Um, the boy, Ambi, and his mother, they are the two invalids. Um, and that uh, is referenced at the beginning of the story. And in one of my sessions, I, I said that this is a deceptively calm beginning. You know, it opens in a domestic scene where the father is getting ready while the mother and the son are sleeping because they have earned the right because they are sick. Um, in my understanding, uh, I kind of tend to uh, compare this particular scene with the household of Rauta, which is full of women and useless men. And this old man comes to work, whereas the rest of his family are at home or invisible. So that same parallel can be seen in this household too, even though the boy sometimes comes into work to do the sums at a later uh, point in the day, but that we can see the parallels there when the head of the household, the old figure there in Rawata and this shop owner are the ones who are shouldering the responsibility of the entire household. So um, I see that parallel. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, now we are living in a world of technical boom. Like, as I said earlier, we are equipped with everything. So in such a world, how do you analyze the relevance of a short story like, like Reflowering? Okay. Yeah, it, you, you're quite right to contextualize this story in this technological age. There, there are plenty of missionary around our um, supreme technology, which makes life easier for us and, and more complicated as well. And in that context, this particular short story gives us a window into how the human spirit spirit is affected by machinery and what are the emotions um, and the impact of the machinery on the human emotions that is given through the life of Rauta especially that paragraph in the story when um, the father the grandfather collapses under the weight of the calculator uh, figuratively speaking he hardly says anything he becomes hollow emaciated lifeless almost like a walking corpse so that impact of machinery on individuals on individual human beings who are very weak who are very vulnerable who are financially in great difficulties is made apparent in that story and i think this story kind of sensitizes us to such a context we need to see things in perspective we cannot always see things from the perspective of the human be uh, on the perspective of the machinery. We also need to see the impact of the machinery on the human beings. That's where literature comes in, I think. Okay. Yeah. Mom, I actually found the relationship between the shop owner and Rautu to be very interesting. Like at one point we can see Ambi's father shouting at him and on the other point he actually secretly pays his debts and all. So can you speak on the love hate relationship yes. between Rauta yes. and Ambi's father? Yeah, yeah, you're quite right uh, to kind of describe it as a love-hate relationship. Because if you go back to the first crisis and uh, the wife of the shop owner says that, why do you keep on this ritual of fighting with him and then making up with him the next day? You know, why can't you put an end to this? You know, is Rauta the only person on this earth who can do all these sums so quickly? And he simply says, shut up. And then he sends his son to bring the old man back. So even though he um, kind of uh, is harsh 
towards him at certain points he changes his attitude at some other moments especially in moments of great crisis and especially in the middle of the story um the big crisis for autha is um the fact that he's going to lose the house um pretty quickly unless some someone helps him out and that someone is um upper the shop owner you know without having um you know without talking about it there's uh, if you look at the story there's no narration there as to how upper reacted he just gets on to the buggy and then both of them drive to the lawyer and everything is sorted right so that tells you how quickly he has reacted to this big crisis in the life of ravata and he comes to the rescue he is kind of the knight in shining armor for this old man so um there is a back and forth there's a back and forth and he does get really offended by ravata when when he goes to work in a rival shop which is probably why when he visits bombay he gets this calculated this new device which will cut him down to size in some sense so um again but in the finale despite the fact that ravata is no longer useful you know uh, the calculator is there anybody can do the sums but the old man is also there in the store he doesn't chuck him out you know the very mi- next minute when the calculator has arrived he doesn't chuck him out he still keeps him right so that tells you that there is a certain warmth a bond between the two okay ma'am uh, one not not worth the instance in the story is that like ravata gets to know about the existence of calculator like it is something that can replace him so how do you analyze his response yeah it's it's a very um human beings are very complex uh, and uh, they do get stressed out they do buckle under the pressure um they do kind of lose the spirit when um a machine has come into the picture come into the society which may replace quite a lot of human beings and and do things quite easily and quickly but then um human beings um have highly evolved brains i suppose and once a ravata gets a tiny space um to realize that he still is valuable he fights back so that sp- tiny space is given to him by um the mistake made by murugan there that one minute and he exploits that and he completely gets the control back very quickly and one after the other he immediately his human uh, brain is so supreme that he kind of marshals one incident after another and all of them tell the shop owner that look these are all the faults that are going on in your shop you just pay attention you just realize how important i am so human beings have brains a highly evolved brains that can react pretty quickly under pressure and that is an example that we get from this particular story okay he kind of exploits that uh, murugan's fault right yeah now. absolutely he does it and it, it's very interesting as i mentioned in my earlier sessions as well that he keeps quiet when um he knows that um the shop has these three ways she's there only seven of them have been sold out three of them are there lying in the store and he doesn't intervene in that conversation between the customer and murugan and say oh hang on those wasties are there you can sell them. he keeps quiet then whether that is because of all the pressure that he is going through or he deliberately deliberately has lost any interest in the store we don't know but he does keep quiet mm-hmm. and he uses that example when the uh, time is right mm-hmm. that tells you how fast he reacts mm-hmm. that old man reacts okay so ma'am do you think that ravata has a sense of loyalty to ambi's father because like at one point we can see him working with chettiar for paying his debts and can we say that his loyalty cannot be substituted by any machine or any other worker okay yeah it's it's a it's a interesting question and um there is no straightforward answer because um we can only speculate on certain things but um in my understanding we can see that ravata is going through tremendous financial stress which is probably why despite the fact that the owner has bailed him out he has paid about 5000 rupees and 5000 rupees in those days is quite a big sum of money he, so the owner has um you know shelled up this big sum of money and rescued him but the very next day he goes to the chetia shop and and does the um, bills for him and you know sometimes it's humorous you know it's very anti climatic because you expect one thing and something totally opposite happens and everybody is shell shocked and that is sometimes brings a element of humor um in that uh, mismatch in that incongruous set of uh, events so um why does he do that why does he do that um and he says that i have lost my head aya and that's the only statement that he makes and he says that the chetia promised me to clear all my debts 
So um, you you have the financial crisis on one side and the loyalty on another side, and he picks the the most difficult you know uh, thing between the two you know. So he go he goes to a person who can sort all of his money worries. So um, we kind of tend to sympathize with Ravata in that regard because you can see the extent of the damage that financial crisis can do to you. He loses his home very nearly. The entire f- women of his family are out there on the streets in a bullock cart right so he has seen the worst and he doesn't want similar scenarios to happen which is why he goes back to um, not to his usual shop but to the Chetia shop even though that's a rival shop even though he knows that he's going against the grain you know he's breaking his loyalty the bond of loyalty so we need to put everything in context and understand the set of circumstances there so um, you can take your pick in that um, extreme uh, circumstances Okay, ma'am. Uh, actually, Michel Foucault, on his uh, seminal essay of Utopias and Heterotopias, he talks a, a lot of interesting things about space. So, uh, he considers public space, social space, and work, uh, place of work, place of pleasure, all these as contrasting spaces. But in this story, in, which is set in a particular Indian context, there is a mingling of social space and uh, public space. So, sorry, uh, private space. So, how do you consider this mingling? Mm. Okay, um, let me respond to the ideas in your question uh, by talking about the spatiality, um, the spatial uh, ideas um, in this particular story. We have two major spaces. Uh, we have the private space of the homes. We have the home of Ravata, we have the home of um, the shop owner. So we see those two uh, private spaces there and we have the public space of the clothes shop in this particular story. Now, my understanding of a private space is one where there is domesticity there, where there is a family there. Okay, and there's more importantly a woman who runs the household. So that would make a space um, a private space. But if you look at the public space, it's a place where business is carried out so we have the shop as the business space or the public space in this particular story the closest that the private space comes to the public space in this particular story is when the family of Ravata come to the clothes shop especially the women of the household come to the clothes shop so that's where it literally comes closer uh, and the women are there in the bullock cart and there are uh, curtains on either side of the um, cart to give privacy to the women. So um, that private space migrates to the public space to get protection from the public space there because the head of the household is there. So that's the, um, you know, a coming together of two spaces. But otherwise, usually the public space is all about uh, profits, money making and um you know proper b- behavior etiquette uh, etiquette and all those uh, sort of things and um even though there is a bond between uh, router and um, the shop owner even though there's a bond between gomati and uh, uh, the old man even though there's a bond between ambi and router and they call one another tata and other things other familial terms money is the one thing that connects everybody so and Ravata is extremely affectionate towards Ambi probably because he is the shop owner's son. So there the private even if there is a private uh, familial connections that familial connection is brought about through the idea of business the element of business. So we need to keep those things in mind when we think about speciality. Okay ma'am. Uh, ma'am, in literature, there are many instances in which blindness is interpreted as the beginning of wisdom. We can cite Oedipus, the story of Oedipus as an example. So, do you think that Ravuta, he also has such a real uh, vision problem? So, can we consider his vision as real vision and which with which he can see many things that others can't? Okay, it's a very good question. Uh, um, the idea of um, blindness being associated with wisdom that's coming from uh, Oedipus is a very good um, you know, parallel that we can think about. Uh, but in the context of this particular story, uh, reflowering, it's quite complicated. We cannot uh, one-dimensionally apply the idea of wisdom to uh, Rauter. The reason being, uh, he is a math whiz. He's a genius in that regard. He can do sums uh, pretty 
pretty quickly um, that no one can do uh, in such a quick time. So he's a genius in that regard, but he is a financial mess in another regard. So there's no wisdom in the way he runs his household. And he probably has good reason why the finances are in disarray, but it is an indication that he's not able to run his home in a practical manner. And again, I, I'm reminded of that um, crisis, the first crisis where he buys clothes for the entire family, right? And um, we really need to ask, is that a good thing to do when his finances are in such a difficult um, set of uh, circumstances? He buys clothes for each and every member of the household and his household is huge, right? So is he being over generous? Is he not being very smart with his money? Are some of the questions that come up to our mind. So um, he is, that's what Colpin also wants us. He can be a uh, maths genius, but he can also be an idiot um, in certain practical uh, areas. So we, we cannot one dimensionally as i said apply wisdom to ravita but he can be very crafty too he can be crafty in some other areas especially towards the end of the story we can see how manipulative he becomes in order to show his dominion over the others in order to prove his memory uh, ma'am the opening sentences of the story it portrays a family in which the mother and son they are sleeping heartfully and the father is getting himself ready for his job so do you think that reflowering deviates from Indian works in the depiction of a traditional Indian family? Right. Okay. So my question back to you would be, what exactly is a typical Indian family that's represented in Indian literature? Uh, and that's a massive area. Yeah, actually, like I'm not saying it should be like that, but usually it's believed that like the man of the house, he'll be sitting comfortably or he'll wake up as he want and the woman of the house or the women will be expected to do the daily cause mm -hmm. uh, they will be expected to cook food for her husband and help him in getting ready for the job so that's like a usual morning scene of an Indian family maybe like that mm, mm, mm. I, I understand where your question is coming from you you want to um, know why the women are resting when the men uh, or the male of the household is kind of getting ready for work all on himself without getting any help from the uh, women folk um, this story doesn't give us a window into the activities of the mother of the family there's no space in fact if you um, look at uh, many of the fiction when it has a particular theme that it wants to communicate and explore, it will try to limit the um, expenditure of words on other areas. So mm -hmm. my assumption is that not a great light is thrown on the mother of the family, uh, the Amma who is ill, and we do not know what exactly are the things that she does on a daily basis to uh, prepare the house, get the house running, because the father usually is at, um, at the shop. So obviously she has to do something or the other at some other point in the day, but we don't get a window into her life because the narrative doesn't go there okay oh. so uh, we, we we need more light um, on, on her life which the author for some reason or the other doesn't give us because that would take us away from the coherence of the plot which is about Ravutar and his uh, predilections and, and his mood swings okay and reflowering is actually divided into according to me it's divided into three main parts or instances how do you analyze the need and significance of such a division what are the three parts um, in the story, uh, um, in your opinion? First, I think it's actually the mention about the problem, the issue between Ambi's father and Rauta. And second is the instance in which how Ambi manages to bring Rauta back. And third, I think, is the introduction of the calculator. Okay. So, um... I would see the story as uh, having a proper introduction in the sense that it introduces Ravata, his character, and how does the rest of the society deal with him. So that I would think is the uh, introduction to the story, the, the first part. If I, if I divide the story into three parts, that would be the first part in my assessment. The second part is the high point or the critical uh, uh, point in the story, the, the rising action. The rising action would be the auctioning of the house and how that event makes the rest of the society um, sort them out in some sense. And that sorting out is done by the father. So that would be the middle section of the story. And the last one, or the high point or the crisis in the story would be uh, when the calculator comes into the picture and how Ravata and the rest of the society around um, 
router deal with both these things deal with both the calculator and with router one is gradually becoming redundant in the presence of the uh, machine and how does router kind of um, you know rescue himself you know through his uh, uh, machinations how does he do that and how do the rest of the society respond to his uh, rescue plan so that would be the last uh, stage in the story so that's how i would divide the story the one being the introduction the second being the middle when um you know we also tend to see the humane side of appa when he rescues raute and finally the really complicated part when uh, raute is in a hole really in a, a difficult hole and how he climbs out of that hole and everything becomes normal when things are resolved at the end of the story okay um and it's often said that real gems can be found in a bin so can we consider rautar as a pro- genius who could not rise above the status of a shop manager in spite of his great talent okay yeah um you're quite right he is a gem he is a genius he is a wizard uh in terms of his uh calculation abilities in terms of his uh, math skills and if you notice um his own words about his identity in the story he says that i'm no longer a mere adding machine and um, there is a sudden rise from being a mere adding human machine to the manager you know one who is all powerful he's next only to the owner so that in itself is a massive race in fact for raute because he's very old we constantly need to remember his age because we tend to forget that and then he's blind as well and he hasn't not been uh, educated really highly he just went up to the third grade or something like that so despite his lack of education traditional education uh, systematic education despite his age and despite his disability he rises to the position of a manager so that is a big race in fact and that is an achievement in itself that needs to be recognized and applauded and um and and that's something not everybody will manage to do okay yeah ma'am do you think that the calculator was introduced intentionally by ampi's father as part of his endeavor to cut raute down to size yes absolutely um i would think that is a deliberate introduction on the part of the author and um the, uh, the figure that he uses to introduce um this thing is the uh, ambi's father and that's a deliberate uh, authorial decision because um we need to realize that um appa is terribly offended and uh, he's sick to death about the behavior of raute he says that you have hurt me deeply um because um i helped you out i gave you so much money but despite that you don't show any gratitude um he says that i even lose trust in women mothers because they are supposed to be highly trustworthy but you know your behavior would make me tr- uh, you know distrust even the figure of the mother so he is really offended and hurt and then he when he visits bombay he brings back the machine and he knows that this will really um make ravatar realize that he is no longer the most important figure and if you notice the narration it's very interesting to note that the father doesn't make any comment about the calculator his perspective is totally absent in the story we get to hear about the mother we get to hear about the boy and uh, we get to hear about gomuti we get the reaction of ravatar about the calculator but the father the owner is totally silent because he knows the effect the calculator is having on this old man and he has deliberately um you know wanted that reaction from yeah. raouter and he completed succeeded to absolutely to a certain extent yeah. until he comes yeah. back again to life yeah. the old man shall we say that the introduction of the calculator actually persuaded raouter to stress his indispensability and thus made him more competent and this indeed can be extended to the society in general yeah yeah absolutely um and this relates to the earlier question that we were talking about how human brains constantly evolve when it is faced with a crisis and that crisis could come in the figure of a machine it could come in the figure of a new invention so when that new invention threatens Uh, the value of a human being and the human being kind of tries to work out the best possible escape so when um raute is faced with this um, a demon of a calculator and when he realizes that he has to think fast he does it he does it when he is given a loophole he really picks himself up and he climbs out of that a uh, difficult situation pretty quickly and that is an indication of the worth 
and the skill of human beings in general in society because they constantly refashion themselves um, in order to uh, stay relevant and, and continue to dominate uh, everything, be it technology or be it the planet. Okay, ma'am. Uh, do you think that the calculator brought a kind of equality that enabled servants like Gomadi to do sums like Rahuta? Yes, yes, absolutely. Again, a very good question because uh, you can see that, um, you know, the um, almost illiterate Gomadi um, who studied only up to uh, fifth standard uh, or the boy who who is um, in the shop um, doing the sums with the help of the calculator, everybody gets power at the end of the story. Um, you know, be it an adult or a boy, educated or not, um, you know. So uh, this calculator performs an uh, egalitarian function in some respects. It makes everybody equal and um, that idea really worries um, Raut. He, he doesn't like that happening because if that happens his value will be lost. So um, you're right the calculator makes everybody equal in terms of the functions it performs for them because it, it can answer to everybody and anybody it has no uh, masters, the calculators have no masters. You just have to key in and the answers are there for you. Yeah, and when I found the ending remark very interesting. Actually, uh, he remarks that uh, he is no longer a mere adding machine, but the manager of the shop. Uh, does this instance point to the fact that machines help us to do away with the activities that will waste a lot of time and energy of human beings and thus will help us to spend their potential on achieving higher aims? Yeah. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, they can do the drudgery. They can do the really hard, uh, you know, mechanical labor, uh, whereas the human beings can focus on, on the things that can really be valuable to society. But in the case of um, reflowering, in the case of Ravata and the shop owner, um, once the calculator comes into the picture, we realize there's so many other things that are going wrong for the shop. You know, so we also realized that the shop owner really needs help with so many other things which have not been taken care of until this moment. So um, Rauta really comes uh, to the rescue, if, if we think about it. He comes to the rescue of the shop owner because he points out so many areas which need attention and which would not be looked at before then, before the advent of the uh, calculator. Because he would be busy doing all the calculations and the maths, he would not be thinking about the other things which need some kind of assistance to be sorted out so yes he um, the calculator makes human beings think about things that really need care and attention you're okay. right that's all thank, thank you very much for your questions uh, i hope you enjoyed the conversation i'll catch up with you in the next session